You are listening to Beyond the Verse, a Star Citizen podcast. A show dedicated to Cloud Imperium Games, Star Citizen, and Squadron 42. Whether you fight, explore, unite, and or trade, we bring you news, updates, interviews, reviews, and analysis. So sit back, relax, grab yourself a pour of Radagast, and join us as we go Beyond the Verse. Launch sequence activated. Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 17 of Beyond the Verse, Star Citizen podcast with your host, Solus. So sorry about last week. As many of you know, I work at Amazon and we were right in the middle of Prime Day. So my happy ass was in Seattle, Washington, handling all of that fun. Um, as you know, following the socials, you saw ask uh, we saw you saw us ask a lot of questions um, on what you're buying to enhance your Star Citizen experience. And we're actually going to get into a lot of that later on in the podcast. So what you can expect on this week in Star Citizen, uh, we have the Arena Reborn Part 3 from last Friday. Then we get into Saturday, which, spoiler alert, there's an event that we definitely want to talk about today. Um, It was a 30 versus 30 versus 30 tank event between three content creators sanctioned by Star Citizen uh, that has a lot of conversation needed to unpack. Stay tuned, stand by. Uh, we, on Wednesday, we had a CitizenCon Intel drop. Uh, a reminder that booth applications are ending the July 31st. And then an Atmos Sports kind of addition to the experience called Fight or Flight. We'll get into both later on towards the end of this podcast. And then last but not least, uh, we wanted to go over some of the th- ways to enhance your gaming experience. So I did shell out a lot of money <laughs> and got a uh, Toby eye track uh, tracker. I got a nice little model that I'll talk about from JRDF phenomenal company. Um, again, later on in the call, but let's take the gloves off, go right for the jugular. Let's go into this last Saturday and who better to throw into the conversation than one of the three content creators his name is Chris. His handle is Blasphemous. Sir, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. You bet. You bet. First podcast is what I'm hearing. <laughs> it is. Very first podcast ever. Yeah, it's a little different. Like, it's not, you know, much live. It's not much like entertaining community. It's like production and like really knowing what you're about to say. It's improv, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, great. So, so what I wanted to do first off, I wanted to give you the platform. Maybe introduce yourself. Um, this podcast is hitting around 19 countries. Um, it's a great breadth of audience that might not know who Blasphemous or Chris is. So, please feel free. Love to hear you introduce yourself. As I know, probably most of the community here in the chat room already knows who you are. But all right. Um, well, I'm Blasphemous. I go by Chris. Everyone calls me Chris. Uh, content creator for Star Citizen. Um, Full time uh, stream on Twitch. It's the only place that I really like focus on. Um, but yeah, that's about it. Just, uh, <laughs> I've, been, I've been streaming Star Citizen for just over a year now. Yeah. Uh, started April 14th of 2022. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah, you're you're actually one of the first content creators that were streaming that I started watching. So really, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So what I did when I first created this, like you know, at the beginning of the year, I went through who Star Citizen was following and just kind of like followed who you know had production value. And you're one of the first ones I watched, and you do an amazing show. I actually crashed your show earlier today. Uh, your production value is amazing. So absolutely i really appreciate that yeah i recommend anybody listening uh to this to go check them out on 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 twitch um but here's here's kind of the backstory and why i wanted blasphemous specifically or chris specifically on this i asked a poll so saturday happens we'll get into the details here in a little bit but i created a poll that gained some traction over six thousand impressions almost 500 votes um it generated a lot of conversation about it but I felt a certain way going into this poll. 
I, I asked basically, uh, how do we feel about Saturday's events? Do we, do we approve the actions of a few trying to go and sabotage or disrupt a content creator event, or do we disapprove it for the most part? And I actually went into this thinking, fair game. Let's go. Like let's it, it's it's the persistent universe. Anything goes. Even Tyler Whitkin, CIG supports the approach um, of anything goes, PvP yourself or protect yourself, right? Right. It wasn't until Chris, it wasn't until you <laughs> said something in that thread that completely changed the way I viewed this. And that is why I wanted you on this conversation. So you said the word organic. And that is right. what changed my entire opinion. So do you want to go through kind of what led up to this? What led up to the events? What was the planning process like? And kind of walk us through Saturday. Uh, yeah, so obviously um, it, there was a lot like of preparation going into the event. Um, we kind of got the event from my Twitch chat, someone mentioned we should do like a 15 v 15 org battle and uh, me and Bell was like, let's turn it into like a 30 v 30 v 30 with like two other content creators. So we, you know, we reached out and um, the Smashly and uh, Authy, both of them said they'd love to be, you know, they'd love to participate in it. And that's when we kind of started laying the groundwork for it. And I didn't really have to do a whole lot. Bell's the one that took care of most of it. Authy made the flyers for it. And um, all I had to do was make sure come the day of everybody had their armor, their ammo and, you know, just their kits and everything. Yeah. Um, and for the like 24 hours leading up to the event, that's basically all I was doing was handing out armor, am ammo and yeah. medical supplies you know and um yeah then the day of we all um got into one big party and we launched into the pu to spool up a new server yeah um so after we launched so we in the stuff. lobby in the lobby you had what all 90 or you had 100 and um <sighs> We had 97 people in the lobby. Okay, that's that's yeah. a significant amount. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was huge. Yeah. It was yeah. crazy. Like all of like whenever we loaded in, we were all at Port Tressler, and it was yeah. crazy just seeing that many names there. You know, like in yeah. one party. Um, yeah. But for some reason, whenever we launched, it didn't prioritize the party. Uh, some of our members were stuck in an infinite loading screen. Um, and then like the undesirables were able to load in that yeah. way. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, so before we get into actual Saturday, the precautions that y'all took going into the planning, like you didn't choose a jump point. You didn't choose like a mining no. facility. Like it was come to find out afterwards, like it was a very discreet kind of unknown location. Right. 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 It was this kind of, um, just literally uh, somewhere on the surface of microdeck i think yeah. the nearest jump point was 250 kilometers away got it got it yeah so i think that's important for the listeners and the viewers on youtube to to also consider is like the intent was and the vision and everything was set up to be its own discrete kind of location to prevent the organic sabotage that i think we all are okay with right we we kind right. of celebrate that so walk us through saturday y'all y'all get started 1 p.m central i think was when it was supposed <laughs> um, to go live. we actually all started uh we started the event was said was set to start at 1 p.m central yeah uh we started preparing at 12 central and uh just like grouping up that's when we launched into a server um we noticed there were some people there that we didn't want there so we tried another server yeah. that that itself took forever um yeah just getting everyone out and you know uh Apparently, new, new servers don't spool, but every 10 to 13 minutes. So even mm. after we were in the lobby, we had to wait. Yeah. And, you know, uh, yeah. we finally get into another server. Yeah. And we noticed that they're, and they made it in the server as well. So we're like, all right, whatever. We'll we'll run with it. You know, we'll do what we can. Sure. Know? 
Um, so the way that the we had it set up was everybody was in one party. We had Belle take a box mission, share the mission out to everyone. Yeah. So that she could run, pick the box, and set it on the planet as a uh, center point. Okay. So everyone could be able, like, even after we drop party, they'd yeah. still be able to see as a center point. So everyone waited for her to go, like, set that and get just get the area ready. And then uh, we all started heading down. Um, I think I pulled out a couple of ships for other people just to, like, fly security. Um, not that it did any good. <laughs> there were uh, <laughs> a couple of new pilots, sadly, but it was a retaliator and an eclipse. And I'm like, how, you know, how bad can it be? Um, <laughs> Famous last words. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, anyways, we, we finally, oh Lord. Um, we had so many issues just getting everybody to the surface yeah. on the way down or leaving the, uh, the station bells, Carrick despawned, leaving a bunch of people, 50 kilometers away from the station out in space so we had to get them yeah um and then finally we got everyone aboard my 890 we took it down and bell got everybody from space and uh her character down there yeah and we uh we started unloading the tanks we finally got my crew on the ground in in tanks ready to go and uh some of smashless crew was coming in Authy had some issues coming in whenever they went to jump to the location. Um, a security ship hit her 890 and soft deathed it. Oh. So, so, so I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna pause you real quick. So, all right, one of the first sentiments that came across my poll was, oh man, I'm actually happy that content creators were not able to get an event launched. Like, there were people actually upset or actually happy that content creators were not successful launching an event. But there's a part of me that actually, I, I want to pause on what you just said. Like, everybody had issues logging in just like everybody else. Right, like, oh yeah, like Smashly yeah. had issues. It sounds like Authy had issues. You had issues. Like, this is not some weird conspiracy theory that CIG has it out, <laughs> you know, for the player base. Like, that is also a very valid conversation, maybe for another podcast, another day. Right. Um, but I it's, mean, I will say, some people think the content creators have better servers, and uh, yeah, I assure them we do not. Right. It is the same servers as everybody else. It, and you work for CIG, right? I just, I'm we very no, no. I, <laughs> <laughs> do not. No? Okay. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. Please continue. I just, I think that's a very, um, it's a very good point. But I don't, I don't think Althe ever actually made it to the ground. Um, Smashly was coming to the ground and she crashed the desktop. And I think by the time she finally got in, all of the A2s were in there. And uh, the server had already started the 30k. Yeah. Um, which, I mean, we, we weren't even, like, really mad about it. We were going to try to shoot down the Moabs and just see what we could do, you know? Like, <laughs> I think I think the people watching were more mad about it than we were. Sure. Um, sure. So I think this is a know, I think this is a great stopping point or pausing point. So, all right. So a couple things here. Um, one, I would have loved to have seen 90 people on the ground. Eight, eight tanks, you said, or however yes, many? Yes, eight tanks. Eight, eight tanks, tanks per team. 90 people like going against eight A2s. Like, l let it play. Never. Let it play. That would have been yeah. hilarious to watch. Um, even if everybody gets nuked, people love dumpster fires. There's, right. There's validity there, right? So I would have loved for that to continue to happen. Um, I asked you before the podcast what you thought about this, but another sentiment was uh, CIG pulled the plug. The 30K was caused by Star Citizen. And how did you respond to me? Um, they definitely didn't. Yeah. Uh, what had happened? Like CIG, they like they they are never they will not step in ever. Um, they just won't. Uh, yeah. They catch. I mean, first thing is they catch too much backlash. You know, like sure for showing favoritism to anyone, right? Yeah. Uh, secondly, the reason of the thirty k was all the freaking moabs in the yeah. ground i mean yeah and uh i think in one of smashley's clips you can see just five four or five moabs just spinning around on the ground yeah you know 
Yeah. So, so, uh, I, I th- again, I that would have been fun to watch. I would have I would have loved to have watched like that full out Spectrum War, and I'm actually going to share my screen real quick. Um, I think CIG. I think CIG actually also supports what you and I are saying. This idea of like, let it play out. And I'm actually going to read um, CIG's stance, Tyler Whitkin's stance on how they feel about this interaction. So I'm going to go ahead and share the one screen uh, for for our, uh, our brief. Let me get actually to boom. Here we go. Okay. So... This is back on March 2nd, 2020. So several years ago, over three years ago, um, Zylo, Tyler Whitkin, um, writes an article, Excessive Griefing and Stream Sniping. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to read this verbatim, and then me and Chris will discuss. Hi, everyone. We've recently received a lot of reports detailing excessive griefing and would like to take a moment to openly address the feedback and share our stance. For a majority of these matters, a PVP solution is preferable break i think everybody in that vote thread echoed that same sentiment in a in an mmo simulation let it play out it does suck like i i've been a victim of doing like a box mission and getting my ass handed to me but you know i look back on those moments and i'm like yeah i probably should have had a gun on me like (laughs) i wasn't like a jumpsuit nothing else so you know you learn over time but i think most people can agree that pvp is is the right solution back to the article Frequently, when these scenarios are reported to us, we encourage those who feel they are being targeted to rally with their friends and orgs in an attempt to fight back. And I think eight tanks and, you know, I don't know, 90 players on the ground is or, you know, (laughs) rallying your friends. We're not here to protect players from aggressors, pirates or NPVPers. It's the right answer. A big part of Star Citizen is about that dichotomy, that epic clash that occurs when opposing forces meet and rally others to their cause. The wars at Jump Town were a prime example of the exciting emergent gameplay that can blossom when a lawful player comes face to face with an outlaw. However, there is a line that is occasionally crossed where players are going outside the bounds of immersing themselves as a pirate PvPer. Some users are going to go out of their way to leverage live streams and other mediums to excessively grief. In many of these cases, it's no longer about enjoying the game, but rather disrupting it. Stream sniping, pad ramming, firing into armistice zones, or utilizing various exploits to grief others. These are just a few examples of excessive griefing, which we do not tolerate. He goes on to say, if you find yourself on the receiving end of this, we are more than happy to investigate. And in cases where it's warranted, we will absolutely intervene. Simply reach out to us through our support page at this link. And make sure to provide as much information as possible. Screenshots, videos always help. In addition to better monitoring, preventing excessive griefing, we're also exploring a number of in-game changes that should help considerably. More info on that at a later time, which break, like, in three years, I don't feel like there's been much of a difference. Like, (laughs) I don't think the law system really uh, prevents that from happening three years later, but my own take more info on that at a later time and of course in the future the law system will also play a stronger role in creating consequences for unlawful behavior in the meantime and all the time take the sage advice of two wise individuals who once posited that we should all be excellent to each other and party on dude whenever possible so yeah so i i wanted to read that because that cig's approach is yeah Let's go. Let's ha- let, let's sabotage what we can sabotage and let's celebrate that because it is ultimately a sandbox MMO. Anything goes. Um, I actually agree with that. I think where we draw the line is the organic piece. If my happy ass is flying in A2 and I see 90 people on a ground, I'm probably going to nuke the crap out of you. Like, I don't know. Oh, absolutely. Because, I, because I can, <laughs> right? Um, but going going from one server to another in order to execute that, I think that's where we draw the line. How do you respond to Tyler or Zylo's uh, stance on this, Chris? Oh yeah, like if if this had been completely organic, I wouldn't have cared. Like had a single care. Uh, the only issue I had was them following us across servers. Um, sure. 
That's and like if anyone wants to bring up TOS, that's the only thing that they broke in TOS. They didn't stream snipe. There was no way for them to stream snipe. Everybody covered their screens when flying to the locations, and you know, like yeah. we we did everything that we could to make sure that nobody could stream snipe. You know, like yeah, and we've had Discord muted to the streams so that if anyone did say the location, it wasn't there. But um. Uh, yeah, whenever, like, you know, if you look in the TOS under the harassment, it, it mentions, like, following a group across servers, and that's that's where I feel like they crossed the line. Sure. Had it been organic, like, no problems for me, you know, like, not an issue with it at all. Yeah. Because, I mean, I, like, literally all I do is shoot at people in the game. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Yeah. If I die, cool. If I live, awesome. Even better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it's funny. So, so quick aside, I, I am guilty of pad ramming. And let me explain myself before, like, I just get canceled. Um, <laughs> this is before. This is before I knew that it was like against TOSs. But I, I would spawn a ship and leave an orbital station, and some dude with a red chevron crime stat would just kill me. I suck at at dogfighting. I suck. I'm horrible at it. Right. Um, so yeah. I, I ended up like we'd go back and forth. Like I would launch, he'd kill me, they would kill me, and we'd just keep on going back and forth. So I'm like, you know what? Screw this. The next time I see them land, I'm just gonna like fly into their shit and ruin their day. <laughs> so like there's some point of like the game almost encourages that behavior. Um, it, it encourages the creativity of making your own fun. And I think that definition of fun is different for people, right? In a game, right. in a game that cancels reputation, resets your gear, um, people are saying, well, why play 319 of 320 is about to come out? People are saying, community is saying that SC is inviting this behavior. So how would you respond, Chris, to those saying that it's the design of the game and people are going to sabotage um, as they see fit? You can... You can sabotage, you know, like, and that's fine. Like you, like, if you want to be a piece of shit, like I'm a piece of shit in game, hundred percent. Like you can be, but like you, you, as long as you go by TOS, there's nothing anyone can say wrong about it. Sure. Like, you kill an Aurora leaving the station. So what? You know, like, as long as you killed them without pad ramming them, then it's yeah. fine. Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter. Yeah, absolutely. Like, that's my thing is like griefing. Whenever someone calls griefing, I say the only thing that I like that I believe to be griefing is breaking two of us, pad ramming, stream sniping, things like that. Like, yeah. that's fair. Yep, absolutely fair. And, and what I'll tell you, so for those of you who are listening to me for the very first time, um, I've been content creating for eight years. I've actually been working in the gaming industry uh, for New World with Amazon. Um, so I have a I have a little bit of an industry uh, perspective or background. Griefing has a different definition for every game and every platform and every model that a game is built for. So how griefing is defined, it's not really up to anybody, you know, it's just this idea of like, do you feel wronged? And then, then you have to talk about emotions, right? Like, I don't know, should you feel right. wronged? Like, should you feel like your butt hurt? Um, and it becomes like a thing. But what I will tell you is the head of community for Amazon, um, he's one of my really good friends. We were talking about this exact same situation leading up to this podcast. He was actually the head of community for War of Tanks. And what he was saying is like a really interesting approach that he took from that community perspective is like he actually he actually celebrated like the quote unquote griefers. They knew who they were and they they partnered with the griefers. And so when they would do events, they would actually set up bounties and say, hey guys, like you can sabotage the crap out of our events, but know that we're gonna set bounties on all of your heads. Like, okay, right. and then then all all's fair in love and war, right? Like at that point, right. you, know, you know, do what your heart's content is, but know that people are going to get extra, you know, loot or extra points or whatever if they kill you. So there's there's an interesting talk about what the solution is, and I would love to pick your brain on your experience, what your community is saying, like your Discord, the Six Squad, as badass as that sounds. What is everybody saying that the future or the solution? Solution is for something like this like what do you think honestly I have no idea like <laughs> nailed it I really don't me <laughs> I, the solution for it you know like 
Okay, so they made SPK the only place you could clear to encourage more PvP, and all they did, all they did was bring in PvE, right? Sure. Nobody really, nobody PvPs at SPK because you're gonna have the station shooting at you the whole time. Right. Like it's like everything that Star Citizen tries to do to encourage PvP is the wrong thing, you know. Like now, and like to discourage players from going or from like shooting at each other. What you go to prison for 24 hours? It takes 15 minutes to escape prison, yeah. max. Yeah. You know, like now it's easier to clear your crime stat because it's faster mm-hmm. like it clears faster than it did before yeah and i mean i just i i don't i don't really know what what they could do like yeah. and i don't think they do either like i'm very yeah. star citizen positive but yeah um i well, just well and that's a that that's a good place to be in my opinion that's a good place to be in you don't want them to have the answers because here's the deal any sort of lever that they pull or thing that they put in place is a removal or a takeaway from my freedom to do whatever I want in the game, right? So anything, like right. if they want to increase the law system and make it even more unbearable, well, what about the times? Like I've been, I spent time in jail for no reason at all. Like I would leave an orbital station and like one of the security guards would just blow up. Like yep. I, didn't, I didn't fire anything, <laughs> but one of the security guards blew up and they're like, crime stat. I'm like shit, like <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean, crime stat? Um, so, like, you don't want to extend, like, the jail sentence. You don't want to make it more unbearable for the accidents and the people that maybe, like, did something wrong and, like, don't necessarily want to go through the punishment. But any sort of variable that they pull for the player base is going to impact more than just the small minority that do this quote-unquote griefing, whatever that means, right? We don't know what that right. means. So here, here's my deal. I, I, I have two solutions, and I would love to hear like your response to these two solutions. So number one, I'm a lore guy. Came from a content creation group called the Lore Seekers. Last 16 episodes, I go into like a lore deep dive at the end of the podcast. So I'm a lore mm-hmm. guy. If a Star Citizen sanctioned event is going on, activate the UEE. Right, the same security, right. the same security that flies for Invictus launch week, turn them on and have them flying wherever they're sanctioned. Right, wherever Star Citizen sanctions this event, heaven forbid you get a crime stat. Right, because you against the javelin or the bingle, <laughs> uh, bingle carrier, like your day's over. So. What do you think about that? It, no, tech resources. Let's get into the whole like racy model of what it takes to make something happen. Like, mm. all right. So yes, there's a tech uh, asset here. But what do you think about like maybe using in-game lore or in-game mechanisms to police or to set up? I think it'd be really cool. It's just in the current state of the AI, and the moment it would be useless because That's I mean you can you can literally go kill a navy hammerhead with an aurora and yeah. You know, but <laughs> if the AI was a little better, that would not be possible. Yeah. But maybe in like 20 years when the game launches. <laughs> totally I think kidding. like the best thing that they're doing right now that will be a good impact for events is the upcoming Arena Commander. Yes. Where you will be able to have your own private events. Yeah. And so I'm I'm glad you brought that up because that was my second solution was something like Arena Commander where they've already said in 320 that we're going to be able to customize um, private servers. That would have been a perfect opportunity for you, Smashly Authy, to get together and say, all right, here's the the player count, the condition standards, the location. I mean, that honestly solves it. But but my question for you is taking it out of the PU. Does that. Does that negatively impact? Does it like take away the Star Citizen esque of the event? It does to a point, yeah. you know. Like we we had a member from uh, the org who gathered gear. He spent thirteen hours gathering gear, you know, because we all wanted we wanted each team to have like matching gear sets, and uh, I, I chose the person security Artemex armor for ours because it's my favorite gear in the game. And it just yeah. looks the best to me. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he spent thir- 13 hours, I think, gathering gear. Um, oh. You know, so, it, like, it takes away the preparation for the event. You know, you just click a button. You're like, oh, I need this. And yeah. And that, that takes away half the fun, I think. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think the in-state, um, you heard it last Friday on the Arena Commander Reborn 3.0. They talked about spectator mode and how like flying your ship and actually like putting, you know, advertisements on the sides of your whole sea, right? Like how sexy that would be. But you almost take that away. You will take that away if you go into Arena Commander and do the custom uh, private servers. So I'm right there with you, man. Like it's, it's, a, it's a difficult problem to solve. It's one that I don't envy CIG on having to face. Like they want this open world MMO simulation, live in space, do whatever your heart desires. But at the same time, this Saturday happens. So I don't envy them at all. Right. <laughs> yeah, ab- absolutely. Well, I've loved this conversation. I, I said 15 minute segment. We're at 31 minutes. <laughs> so oh, <Lord. laughs> yeah, look at me, right? Uh, man, I really do appreciate you being on, Chris. To the community that's over in chat, you guys have been storming chat. Thank you so much for the dialogue. Uh, Chris, if people are hearing you for the first time and they want more of you, how, how do they find you? How do they get more involved in the Six Squad or what you're producing? Um. Well, we run an open community. We've, ever since day one, we've been down to help new players. Uh, I'm live almost every day of the week on Twitch. Everybody is welcome to join. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's a phenomenal, uh, it's a phenomenal community. So first off, Six Squad, y'all are amazing. Just the few couple of minutes I've spent there in chat with y'all, you're very engaging. Uh, It it seems like what you've fostered or what you've created uh, is is, is quite amazing. Thank you again, Chris, for joining us. I hope this finds you well, brother. Yes, I really appreciate you having me. Absolutely. Anytime, anytime. Let me know. All right, moving on to the rest of the podcast. Again, last week, I was in Seattle. We did ask a lot of questions about how you are enhancing your experience in Star Citizen. And it sounds like mainly for the most part, there's three avenues that most people take. All right, so number one, right? Number one, it's joysticks. Like, oh my gosh, there was so much discussion about Thrustmaster versus all these other brands. And so I asked the question, like, which Thrustmaster? And people are like, you're an idiot. Like, don't do Thrustmaster. There's all these other options. So I spent a couple of days looking into joysticks. So we'll get into that in a couple of seconds. Number two, Toby Eye Tracker. Um, And I actually did end up buying the Toby Eye Tracker. I'm actually going to describe my first experiences and I guess overall impression of it. Uh, here in a couple of seconds, but the Toby Eye Tracker was like the number one um, suggested item to get for this game. And then number three, this this is actually really funny. So number three, people were like, listen, if you don't have at least 32 gigabytes of, of RAM, you're not able to actually play Star Citizen. <laughs> you're not able to see or do um, really anything. And so people were talking about upgrading their RAM um, to get the volumetric clouds turned on and et cetera. So here's here's what I did. Here's what I did. So I, I actually got the Toby Eye Tracker um, because of my review and because of morphology uh, or yeah, morphology in his review that he did for the Toby Eye Tracker. Um, and I have been very, very, very happy with that purchase. Again, you can see it right here. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and just go over the website real quick so everybody can see uh, what I'm looking at. But here's the Toby Eye Tracker, the website. It's more than just gaming. And so here's here's one of the things that I look at when I look at peripherals or when I look at ways of enhancing my podcast, audio, visual, uh, gaming experience. I look at what else they're doing outside of gaming. I hate to say this as a content creator, but gaming is very uh, singular. It has its left and right limits. Um, it doesn't really involve a lot of creativity because people look at their left and right limits. How do I get a peripheral out for the current market? They can surmise and project what the next couple of years may look like, but you're going to get kind of the 
next best thing or like like maybe the best thing at this current moment and really nothing more. So what I look at is their entire catalog. What else are they doing? And if you look at Toby and their website, they are doing significantly more than just gaming peripherals. So when I look through their website, just, just quickly, you can do this yourself. I would highly recommend it. It's a phenomenal experience. But go through and look at the research, right? Um, scientific research about the computers and things that they're using with Office uh, implementation. Automotive, ways that they're impacting the automotive industry. And just quickly, training, uh, extended reality with whatever the hell XR is, healthcare. So when I look at this, I think that you're investing Testing. And not only like a peripheral, but a company that is going to be here for the long run. I think the one analogy I would like to reference is the Go, Go XLR. I personally use the Go XLR, but they just up and stopped supporting, or for the future, they will stop supporting any patch or any sort of support. They're, they're gone. They're over and done with. Now, had they been implemented in healthcare and automotive, you have a little bit of more protection, a little bit of more commitment beyond just, okay, we're gonna go ahead and change our sites to something else. So it shows duration, it shows commitment, um, but I can't speak enough on just this first experience jumping on Toby's website. But specifically, if we go into products and we go into gaming, they have a line, uh, the Toby Eye Tracker, this is, Tracker number five. So I will be honest with you. My, my, my first impression, like I got nauseous. Now, Halo training, dive school, all the sexy things that you can do in the Army Special Operations. Like I, I never got nauseous, but here I am, high 30s. <laughs> Maybe I'm just old, but when I first put on, uh, when I first activated the Toby Eye Tracker and I got into my spaceship, it was very disorienting. Um, like not only do your eye movements move like the, the part of the screen that you're looking at, but even your head movements will move the entire camera. And if you're not ready for it or if you're not used to it, it, it can be overwhelming. It, it can really uh, impact your gaming. So my initial reaction was like, oh crap, I'm gonna go and turn this off. There's no way I'm gonna be able to, to really do this. But when I stopped and like, I don't know, I, I chose not to do bounty hunting. I was like, you know, I wanna do box missions. Something that's like not really that big of a deal. I'm gonna do box missions. I noticed that you can you can look up and look at the top of your canopy. You can look to the right and left. You can lean forward and over the edge and see below your ship. When you get out, you can look up and around and see your surroundings. It is one of the most immersive experiences that I have ever had in video gaming. And Star Citizen was already immersive. Star Citizen was already this pinnacle of how to dive into an entirely different universe. Uh, add Toby eye tracking to it, and you feel like you're basically in virtual reality with just your monitor. So I cannot celebrate the Toby eye tracker enough. Um, it's a small bar that easily just gets put underneath your monitor. So I chose to do what this picture shows. I chose to just stick it on the bottom of my monitor, but you can put Velcro on the back and have it stick underneath. It has all different attachments that you can do, but it's a small bar that connects USB and that's it, fire and forget takes very little setup, very little software integration, uh, and you're ready to roll in five to 10 minutes. Um, and it has more than just gaming applicability. It also has uh, work capabilities. So if you're watching one screen, let's say you have multiple monitors up like I do at work. You can be looking at one screen and executing an Excel spreadsheet and doing all your power pivots and all that crap, uh, which involves a lot of like looking around to other tables and other screens well it can actually pick up where you're looking and it'll switch to that monitor it'll switch to that screen and you're able to multi manage um or multi um uh, yeah multi i'll, I'll stay with multi manage <clears throat> it'll it'll help you with those tasks so it's beyond just gaming so i i recommend 
we've got up to like three hundred dollars to spend um toby eye tracker is the way to go in my personal opinion um second piece <clears throat> the ram i did upgrade from like 16 gigabytes to um the 32 gigabytes and it is all the difference in the world it is absolutely all the difference in the world um i can turn on volumetric clouds and actually experience great frame rate right i was at i think like 90 frame rate you know at, at in in one of the capital cities i'm in hurston right now so lorville um ha- had great experiences there haven't had issues since so upgrading the ram i was like corsair vengeance pro uh, for 32 gigabytes so highly 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 recommend that but all to say last week was a phenomenal conversation we didn't have an episode but still engaged with the community and those listening and those on twitter and instagram y'all participating in that conversation over on tiktok phenomenal conversation and I actually took what y'all said to heart and executed so I just need now to uh to get throttles right to get joysticks and I have no idea how or where or what I'm going to commit to (laughs) so still up in the air uh I'll get back to you on socials (laughs) all right moving quickly so that was the um, the Prime Day. So let's get into the CitizenCon updates. We're at 18 minutes to the top of the hour. So I'm going to go ahead and go kind of quickly as we go through this. So CitizenCon, there were two updates for booth applications and for fight or flight. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at fight or flight. <clears throat> So a couple of days ago, actually yesterday at 8 a.m., we had an article on um, Spectrum called CitizenCon 2953 Community Booths Applications Ending Soon. Okay, before I get into this, like I said at the beginning of the call, I've had a lot of experience with Amazon, a lot of experience with TwitchCon and what it takes to build a community booth and the interactions and the expectations, I don't know, KPIs, if you wanna get into how they perform and the impact. Um, But community booths are a phenomenal way of getting your organization, your content creation, um, or really anything that you think needs to be celebrated or broadcasted. It's a phenomenal way to do so, right? You set up in like a a U shape or they'll have this like path that the booths will set up around. You'll have media that goes up and down the aisles. You'll have developers that walks up and down. And of course the fan base will walk up and down, but this is the opportunity to get your name or get your product out there. So I'm going to second CIG. I don't work for CIG. I have nothing to do with them at all whatsoever. Um, But I want to second their kind of like push for the July 31st. Apply if you want this. Here we go to the article. Hey there, citizens. With CitizenCon 2953 fast approaching, we're reminding you about an incredible opportunity that's about to close its doors. The CitizenCon community booths. We've already received many applications, but we don't want you to miss out on being a part of it. Applications for CitizenCon 2953 community booths are closing on July 31st. Yes, you read that right. The deadline for submitting applications to secure a spot for your booth at CitizenCon is rapidly approaching. If you've been contemplating showcasing your organization, community services, now is the time to act. Why should you participate? Participating in this event can be a game changer for your org or community. It's a fantastic opportunity to network and connect with potential recruits, showcase what you and your friends are bringing to the verse, and gain visibility at the biggest Star Citizen event yet. Also, this is your chance to join the CitizenCon team. Getting accepted means your ticket is covered for free, and you'll gain access to the venue outside of normal operating hours. So I'm just going to strategically pause there. Your ticket is covered for free and you'll gain access to the venue outside of normal operating hours. Sounds like a good reason to get your organization or your product out there. How to apply. I'm not going to go through it. <laughs> if, if you want to look into this and you want to apply, go for it. There's an email address. There's uh, questions that you have to address uh, in order to get considered, but do so. 
and there's like maybe 10 items you need to do. But again, I, I can't echo this sentiment enough. If you are trying to grow in the star citizen world as again, a content creator or organization, you need to be applying. I would actually question organizations that are here that are present that can, I would question them not applying. Like, are you wanting a plateau or are you not wanting, you know, to become the next best thing? And if that's the answer, that's fine. Not everybody wants to be millions and millions of gamers uh, in, in their organization. I get that. But this is your chance to do it. Okay. I'm not going to belabor it anymore. I'm going to go straight into the next article. The fight or flight was announced. This is Atmo Sports, uh, Atmo Esports. Uh, that is teaming up with Citizen Kind, officially sanctioned by Star Citizen. So if you're interested, like everything else I do in this podcast, it's straight from the horse's mouth. So if you go to Comlink, you're going to find everything I reference in this podcast uh, straight off of the website. So here we go. Fight or flight comes to Citizen Kind 2953. We're very pleased to announce that we're teaming up with Atmo Esports to bring fight or flight to CitizenCon 2953. This high octane competition will have an epic presence on the show floor, complete with ways to spectate and enjoy live commentary. Fight or Flight is the biggest 2v2 dogfighting tournament in the verse, with this year's online event kicking off on August 19th. Pause. So CitizenCon is not until late October. But this event starts August 19th. That is important. Don't wait around. If you want to be part of this event, it starts like next month. It's not October. It's August. Participants are set up with the predetermined loadouts and will duke it out in the atmospheres of our corp and microtech. Each matchup is the best of three, with the winner of two rounds moving on to the next stage. The top four teams in the online tournament will be eligible to participate in the Fight or Flight Citizen Con Invitational. These eight players will be paired up with eight Star Citizen content creators to duke it out for ultimate bragging rights and an awesome trophy. <laughs> for those looking to test their medal, entries for the online tournament can be found on the Fight or Flight website with signups closing this Friday, June 21st. Want to make sure you don't miss any of the action. CitizenCon tickets are now available. We hope to see you there. And then it goes on and provides information on how to get tickets. So two reactions. One, I'm actually really surprised that general access tickets are still available. For some reason, I would think that this is the first time after COVID that we would have a citizen con, I would think that it would have been wall to wall, like sold out within the first couple of hours, if not days. That's not me second guessing, like what to expect from citizen con. That's not me surmising anything negative. It's just, yeah, if you still want to go, you can't like, if you're listening to this podcast or you're watching it on replay on YouTube, you can still go $200. So it's a little bit on the pricier side, but you're able to go to citizen con. If you still want to, as of right now, 8 49 PM on July 20th, <laughs> uh, you can go to this website. It's also available in the pledge store, but there you go. My second response to this is, uh, as earlier denoted in my conversation with Chris, um, I suck at dog fighting. So I will not be, I will not be competing on August 19th, um, for this dog fighting competition. I, I'm really bad, like, like really bad. And I used to claim like gaming superiority, superiority over most people. Like I'm really good at Elder Scrolls Online when it comes to rotations, Elder Scrolls, uh, Elder Scrolls Online, uh, World of Warcraft, New World. I was really, really, really good at those games. I get into Star Citizen and I'm humbled very quickly. There's something about dogfighting in space. I, I just, I, I can't. Like I literally took the Defender, the Banu Defender. And my ass got handed to me on like a VLRT, like a very low risk target bounty. <laughs> That's how bad I am, guys. Horrible. Could have picked a better ship, arguably. So I will not be participating in this. Um, straight up. Last but not least, <laughs> I do want to spend the last 10 minutes, uh, again, this podcast, the little additional flair that I like providing for my patrons is a little bit of a lore, a lore deep dive. So uh, 
Star Citizen is 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 full of lore. And if you don't believe me, listen to the last 16 episodes. I've only been able to cover like the high marks, the time capsules of what has happened. So I've walked you through basically what 2023. I've watched you from 2023 all the way to the events of Squadron 42 in the first 16 episodes of our podcast. That's a lot of lore, and that's just the, the surface. There's so much more lore to unpack. So I am setting out to always, always reserve time at the very end to cover a couple of things of lore, something else to dive into. If we're getting close to a holiday, you're going to hear Invictus Launch Week, me and the Astro Historian or the Astro Pub goes by Paul. Um, we talked about the Evictus Launch Week for an entire episode. Had a really, really, really great um, conversation. And I have to address this in chat. So how much to shave the beard into a mustache? Not happening. <laughs> I don't know why that comment stuck out to me more than anything else. No. Um, I will not be shaving my beard. Uh, it's, it's too much fun. It's too much fun. Um, lore, lore speaks to me. It's why I play the game. Um, you can you can play a game, and if you're transactional about the game, um, it's very easy to get burnt out. And I think every single one of you listening or watching can relate to that. You play this MMO, Elder Scrolls Online, and once you beat all of it and you have all the things, all the things that you care about, man, you get burnt out. And then you start playing Animal Crossing or some BS, right? Um, <laughs> I had to. Uh, so for me, lore is the additional piece. Like, okay, so what else is there? Can I fly to a asteroid belt find one of the asteroids and land on and find this like vending machine set up by somebody somehow somewhere what does it mean why why is it there the exploration that lore brings to the table i think is something very unique to star citizen as opposed to really any other game uh, because of the ability to kind of do and go and be wherever you know you want to be so i do want to quickly um and i and i do mean quickly because we're at like eight minutes left in the podcast i do want to go over last week's lore makers community questions and there's some really good nuggets here um and again i i will read this fast this is a podcast not necessarily uh for streaming purposes but let me get into the q a uh there's some gold nuggets here so here we go screen sharing for those on youtube this is the lore makers community questions again last week on tuesday the first question what happened to leilani addison question ever since leilani got elected as imperator we haven't heard much about her what happened answer several lore pieces have touched upon leilani addison's successes and failures as imperator some of these details were revealed in articles about the other subjects, so the lore could track her effect on the UEE without each piece focusing on her. Here's a collection of articles tracking Imperator Addison's impact on the Empire so far. I'm not going to get into that. You can read it yourself. But that's just how massive or how deep this lore goes, right? You're going to see like 10, 15 articles that supports one story. Next question. I know there is a desire to make as much unique flora and fauna as possible, but what of humanity's old frenemies? Historically, we have unintentionally shipped rats, mice, this is, this is actually a really good question, rats, mice, roaches, mosquitoes, etc. all over the world, and our record of accidental release is not much better. Uh, while I am sure there will be other alien creatures that fill similar niches, how likely is it we will see a good old space rat tussling with its local equivalent in art corp and other human settlements i don't know why that question I, I love it i absolutely love it the the ties from 2023 to 2953 uh, are a lot more believable than you might think answer the familiar fauna you mentioned are definitely alive and well across the uee space travel has been so widespread for so long that the pests and parasites that have hounded humanity for ages have also found a home wherever we've established one for all the captains who would take the time to systematically vent each section of their ship to ensure no unwanted creatures were along for the ride there would be plenty of others who would never bother however as humans traveled the stars and encountered new species there has definitely been more competition for those earth creatures 
So it wouldn't be too surprising if an alien creature has taken over the vents on a space station that you'd normally expect to see a rat. Love it. Uh, moving on. Let's go. Like I said, quickly. Question. I am curious what Miner's Lament looked like or was before what looks to be an explosion that happened to destroy the station. Will we ever learn this or is it up to the theory groups? I'm actually going to pause. Fly around Crusader's asteroid belt. There is a lot to unpack beyond Grimhex. So you find Grimhex. So literally fly to Grimhex, turn around and just fly through the asteroid field. Worst case scenario, log out, log back in. You're going to end up wherever you last, you know, called your spawn point. But you will find asteroids with, like I said, uh, vending machines set up in a very very particular way stonehenge essentially you're gonna find radio stations that were established on asteroid uh, on, on asteroids like you see in this picture um, you're gonna see destruction or what is left or remnants of stations and it has to beg the question like when did this happen? There's like 950 plus years between the events of today to the actual time in game. What happened? That is where I get to come in. That's where like Paul from the Astro Historian gets to come in and just go crazy because there's so much that we can unpack. Here's the answer to that question. Miner's Lament is so named because it was the home of a tragic mining disaster in 2868, just a hundred years before. A small group of former Shuban Interstellar employees seeking to take advantage of the recently privatized state in the system pooled their resources and formed their own mining consortium. After scanning multiple available claim sites, the group decided on this location near Yella, thinking that it would provide them with the quickest profit. With the funds they had remaining after the purchasing the claim, they contracted out for the, constructions, uh, for the construction of a mining facility, believing the higher volume of ore they'd be able to process would offset the startup costs in the long run. However, when delays and costs over run threatened uh, overruns threatened the entirety of their operations they decided to halt construction and utilize the partially complete stations as best as they could finishing it once they made some profits so Schubert Inter Schubert interstellar now we can get into the background of crusader or the background of hurston impacts that they made on their corporations and the mining facilities and the shipping teams or logistic companies we can get into that and dive into it there's there's going to be a new mission um and for the life of me i can't remember what it's called but where you're going to be uh, going into warehouses of connexes or the 18 wheeler trailers um, that have specific like logos on the outside of them right for the logistics companies and you're gonna have to go to the right one in order to get the right equipment for a delivery station knowing the history of it in the background is going to be important for some reason that immersion is super important to me. I don't necessarily need a blue little triangle or a diamond over my target in order to have fun or to have completionism in this game. It's very, very interesting how they're tying in lore to everything. We have a minute left, so I'm just going to read a couple more and then we're going to call it because again, out of respect of my listeners, my expectation is a one hour podcast. So here we go. Probably our last question. What is the Imperator's equivalent to Air Force One? Now, before I read the question and get into the answer, like I'm thinking like Air Force One in real life. This is America, by the way, for those other 18 countries listening to the podcast. Air Force One is a it is a commercial vehicle. Really, it's a private vehicle with a commercial frame for our government to fly from point A to point B that has all the assets of communication, operations, logistics, all the command decisions that need to be made. So if our president or a government official is in air traveling, they can still make decisions on ground, right? So when I think this, it's nice, it's gonna be formal, it's gonna be, you know, it's gonna have its uh, rich mahogany 
for for you know public releases and media right it's gonna have all that and it's gonna have the capability of everything else i'm thinking it's almost gonna be like a military version of an origin like i'm thinking 890 jump or i'm thinking like a 600 i that just so happens to have this like extra package of just this crazy crazy um capabilities right that's how i approach this question so here we go Question. It's been hotly debated amongst my friends. We had a couple of different ideas that range from a cutter all the way to an 890 jump. Boom. Guesses include Terrapin. Okay, first off, no, 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 not the turtle. No. <laughs> the Terrapin is good for nothing. And if you if you have a different opinion than that, hey, email us, starcitizenbtv at gmail.com. I would love to read your sentiments and hear what you think about the Terrapin. But the Terrapin right now in its current stage it's it's ridiculous i'm sorry next custom spirit e1 called the imperator one okay i see that 600 i exec custom cool 890 jump custom roger and then the carrick i actually hadn't thought of the carrick carrick's not a bad idea so what is the typical craft the imperator uses to get from locale to locale when bringing their press crew with them answer hmm this information is highly classified. That's an easy out. <laughs> I mean, it's so true, but it's such an easy out. This information is highly classified. Since everyone flies ships strapped with weapons, the 1st Marine Combat Battalion goes to great lengths to ensure the Imperator's safe passage to the Empire. This includes using a vast fleet of ships, decoy flights, and other safety protocols that remain a tightly held secret by the 1st Battalion. Unlike Air Force One, the airplane that the President of the United States traditionally travels on, there are no seats for press on flights the Imperator takes for security reasons. Members of the press would board a separate charter with secure comms to the Imperator ship for impromptu pressing briefings. Update. It is worth mentioning that a heavy modified Crusader Genesis Starliner is part of this fleet. The previous administration under Imperator Costigan primarily used this vessel for official travel, but Imperator Addison has stopped that practice because of heightened security measures due to the Vandal War. And there is a lot more to unpack here um, from a lore perspective. I highly encourage going through um, this article. It, it's good questions coming from the community. So you might find something you've been thinking or questions you may have um, answered here from the lore team or the narrative team. So with that, first off, I want to repeat what I said earlier. Thank you, Chris. Thank you to Southern Bell from Hell for getting all that coordinated. I appreciate the beginning of this podcast. What a great conversation we had around quote unquote griefing or just general adversity that we all face in the verse. You've been listening to Beyond the Verse, Star Citizen podcast with your host, Solus. Join our in-game organization, Soul Provision, by applying at www.robertspaceindustries.com forward slash orgs forward slash provision. You can get involved in the conversation with your questions, comments, or emotional outbursts by emailing us at starcitizenbtv at gmail.com. Watch us live on Thursdays, 8 p.m. Central at youtube.com forward slash at starcitizenbtv and follow the conversation over at Twitter and Instagram, both at forward slash starcitizenbtv. Once again, thank you for joining us. We hope this finds you well. Until next time, Safe travels as you traverse beyond the verse.